If you've seen the previous episodes in the series so far, then you know we're tracing our evolutionary lineage through each of our ancestral clades. By now you should be familiar with the cladogram under construction in the Phylogeny Explorer project, and you should understand that you're an organism because you're alive. You're a eukaryote because your cells have a nucleus, you're unicont because your gamete cells have a single flagella, and you're opiscotont because that flagella pushes from behind instead of pulling from the front. Now, some of these developments may not sound that profound if you're not a biologist, but in very brief summary, we've covered at least a dozen really significant evolutionary stages, and these could all be determined entirely by cladistic phylogenetics, analyzing derived synapomorphies compared to genomic analysis. That's what makes cladistics such compelling evidence for evolution. By determining the different parent and daughter and sister categories of what we still are, we can detect an evolutionary lineage and even date it with mutation rates, all without having to refer to a single fossil, though we have shown a few of those too. So you should understand that you're an animal or a metazoan because you're multicellular, and you're a true animal because you have an internal digestive tract, and you're bilaterally symmetrical because you have a left and right side, top and bottom, and front to back polarity that simpler animals like jellyfish don't have. In this video, we'll continue on and look at the subsets of bilateria. Whoa, that's too many. Let's reduce the depth of that down to five. No, that's, that's still too many. Four? No, I don't think we're going to get that far. Not today. Let's bring the depth down to the default setting of three. There, that should do for what we're talking about right now. Okay, for a quick rundown so you know where you are. We don't know much about mesozoans. This clade seems to be nothing but primitive parasitic worms that may be degenerate, meaning they might have once been more advanced than they are now, because evolution doesn't always lead to bigger, better, and more complex. It tries out every direction it can, and sometimes less is more. Remember that all these clades are everything their ancestors were, plus the addition or development of some other trait. But sometimes they can be everything their ancestors were, plus the loss or reduction of some trait too, which looks like what happened here. These are simplified so much they're hard to categorize. Some mesozoans were initially misclassified because they look so much like unicellular protists rather than actual animals. Proaticulata is a group that is often thought of as ancestral to segmented animals like arthropods, though their structure is unique, with alternating isomers rather than the typical mirror image of left and right sides. Like the trilobozoans that were mentioned in the last video, this is another Precambrian phylum known only from the Ediacaran period, having apparently gone extinct 555 million years ago. Xenocylomorpha is the most basal clade of bilaterians, meaning they're karyotypic of our earliest ancestors within that clade. They're typically represented by flatworms, which is a favorite of college biology classes because they're seemingly ancestral to all more advanced animals, yet they're still around. They're triploblastic, meaning they develop three germ layers, just as we do, and they not only have a central nervous system, but a neural network composing the most basic sort of an actual brain. Otherwise, all of bilateria can be divided into two groups, based on a body cavity or lack thereof. It's tempting to group all three of these as acelomates, but that's not an actual taxon. Acelomates have no body cavity between the digestive tract and the outer body wall. All other animals have some sort of body cavity which joins a mouth of some kind at one end and an anus in the other. In many families, most members go about their lives and never do much of anything beyond the norm, but then you have that one unusually successful celebrity who went on to do great things, and that's what we have here. Nephrozoans are characterized by possession of a through gut, complete with a mouth and anus. They're also coelomates, meaning they have a body cavity which is completely tissue lined, resulting in a tube within a tube design. The coelom is a fluid filled body cavity lined with mesoderm, which separates the digestive tract from the outer body wall. A lining of mesentries connect the inner and outer mesoderm layers and suspend the internal organs in a coelom. The adaptive advantages of this body cavity are that it cushions the organs, preventing internal injuries, and allow them to grow independent of the body wall. The non-compressible internal fluid also acts as a hydrostatic skeleton. Nephrozoa is divided into two groups, protostomes and deuterostomes. The definitive difference is developmental. If all this serious biology is making your eyes glaze over, at least indulge me on this one part. As you can see, in the very earliest stages of embryonic development, the first significant feature is this hole or blastopore that opens from one end to the other. Now, in protostomes, which make up the majority of animal classifications at this level, the mouth usually opens first, and then the cavity continues working its way through to the other side, where it opens into an anus. But deuterostomes, which are all these so-called higher animals like us, have it backwards. The hole that opens first ends up being the anus. 
since at this brief moment that is the only significant feature to have developed so far, then there is actually a time in your life when all you were was literally just an asshole. As we move through each of these clades, we've shown how all these developments are synchronized in a geologic history. When this particular division occurred is uncertain. The earliest protostomes ever found are Precambrian, meaning that each of the major developments and divisions of life that we've seen so far, including this one, came before the so-called Cambrian explosion. But the earliest deuterostome fossil ever found so far is 540 million years old, and that puts it in the first period of the Paleozoic era. The Cambrian period is a block of geologic time beginning roughly 541 million years ago and lasting over 55 million years. It's referred to as an explosion of biodiversity because that's when there was a relatively sudden proliferation of a wide variety of different animal phyla. I think of the Cambrian explosion as being like when humans first discovered that powered flight was mechanically possible. That first airplane isn't like anything we have today. Over the next decade or so, there were many other designs exploring every possibility, and some of them were pretty weird. And most of those were failed experiments, and we eventually settled on just the few configurations that worked best. The blind processes of population mechanics also tried out several configurations once life moved into the multicellular level. Some animals developed grabbing and piercing weapons, while others seemed to respond by developing defensive armor without thinking about it or knowing that it was even happening. And just like our early experiments with aircraft, most designs that first appeared in the Cambrian were initially inefficient and were either improved significantly by the end of that period or they were already extinct before then. Regardless whether we're talking about intelligent designs or incidental designs, both were obviously processes of experimental trial and error. And people who don't know what you know from watching previous episodes of this series think the Cambrian was when every kind of life suddenly appeared all at once. But you know better because you've now seen five videos covering the most important of several different stages that all came prior to that, including at least a couple whole phyla who were already extinct before then. How's that for an intelligent design? How did people get this idea? Precambrian fossils were unknown in the early days of paleontology because they're often microfossils or soft-bodied animals with no hard parts. So they're not only more rare, but it takes stricter techniques and advanced technology just to find them. Fossilization is rare in any circumstances, but especially when an organism is really small or when there's no bones or shells. That's the difference with the Cambrian. Mollusks and arthropods both develop shells or exoskeletons at about the same time, and just those two lineages begat a whole lot of different subgroups of animals that have easily fossilized hard parts in patterns that stick out as instantly recognizable. So it's not like anything appeared suddenly, it's just that they were suddenly easy to find. So regardless whether you accept evolution yet, if you followed along on all the ancestral clades and developmental stages discussed so far, you should accept that you are a bilaterally symmetrical animal and all that that implies. The question now is, do you also have the guts, literally, to admit that you're a nephrozoan coelomate? You should also accept that you're a deuterostome because you have to admit that at least once when you were very young, you were basically just a total asshole. <laughs>